Welcome everybody to another episode of the Energy Revolution podcast from Chirp. Today I'm really excited to talk with uh, now an old friend of mine, Tom Erb. Uh, but Tom came to Claremont to go to Pomona College and contacted me uh, to see if he, he couldn't become an intern uh, with our uh, CHIRP internship program through the Claremont Colleges. And um, I was delighted uh, to meet Tom. Uh, he was a very eager, bright young student, very full of anticipation to uh, go to Claremont Colleges and Pomona College and study uh, public policy. Uh, which seemed to fit right in with, uh, with our mission. And uh, Tom worked with CHIRP uh, throughout his years in Claremont, started as an intern working on the Claremont Energy Challenge that we had just started during his first year and was the project manager. He ultimately came to direct one of our major initiatives uh, during his senior year called the Claremont 50 Home Challenge. Tom is now a policy fellow at the Center for Climate and Energy Solutions. The acronym for that is uh, C2ES. He covers state, federal, and international climate policy with a focus on market-based policy mechanisms and climate finance. Prior to C2ES, he worked in the Climate Change Unit at the World Bank. Tom graduated from Pomona College in May 2018 and he studied public policy analysis and politics there and concentrated in environmental analysis. Right now, he's uh, residing in Washington, D.C., and um, you're back in school, right, Tom? Yes, that's right. Thank you so much, Devin, for having me. Um, I am now at George Washington University doing a master's program at night uh, in legislative affairs, so balancing the job at C2ES with that uh, night master's program. So I'm, I'm just excited to dig in here with you a little bit and uh, reminisce, uh, if you will, just for, just for a moment, because uh, we became friends uh, through the internship program. Some people may not be aware of um, how committed uh, CHIRP is to uh, working with college interns. Uh, we've been, uh, we started an internship program here in Claremont about 10 years ago and uh, have had just an amazing um, kind of um, experience uh, meeting and working with uh, college students who are interested in what we're doing. And I think one of the most inspiring things to me was that over the years I've learned that um, the young college students um, are probably more committed uh, to the kind of mission um, issues that we're focused on at CHIRP than uh, most of the adult population. So you and your cohorts have always been uh, an inspiration to me and, uh, and to CHIRP and has provided um, an amazing um, kind of lift and, and, and project capability to, to what we're providing. And so maybe, maybe just uh, tell me a little bit about how you had heard about CHIRP and why you came to uh, to contact me and kind of what some of your experiences were there. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Devin. That's a great, great place to start. Um, thanks again for having me on. It's great to connect and just have a conversation with you. Um, so I think if I remember correctly, we first um, came into contact when the Claremont Energy Challenge was going on and you were starting to reach out to students to create different types of teams focused on different projects under that challenge. Um, and I ended up in the group that was focusing on environmental education. Um, so at this time, this would have been the spring of my first year of college. I hadn't gotten involved in any extracurriculars yet, um, but I was eager to do something related to climate change. And I'm sure CHIRP appealed because of the willingness that you and the organiza organization had to go out and find students and provide opportunities for students. Um, because I think you're right that the passion is already there at the Claremont Colleges. It's a matter of figuring out where students can plug in and then have their skill sets used to the greatest potential. And then, of course, getting some, get something out of it as well. Um, so CHIRP was a really easy way to plug in. Uh, the program made it very easy to balance school with the work that we were doing and then also relate it uh, back to our education. Um, I think the, the most fun aspect of that or, original meet 
uh, was that I actually was in a group with uh, Polina Goncharova, who was a Pitzer student at the time. We met first year uh, at college through the CHIRP program. And Polina and I have now been dating for about three and a half years and live in Washington, DC together. So CHIRP finds a way to engage students uh, and also has a, a matchmaking uh, aspect to it as well. So it's been, CHIRP's been great to me, both in my personal life and then also through my work experience. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, I, <laughs> it's been uh, an amazing uh, ride. Um, and it was fun for me uh, to know both of you for so long too. It's one of the, the joys of um, having interns is uh, amazing people come into your lives. And um, one of the sad things is then most of them uh, end up leaving Claremont like you and Paulina. Um, but now um, we're going to be creating a, a CHIRP next gen program, uh, the next generation, uh, because we want to kind of um, formalize uh, the alumni from um, uh, the CHIRP program. Uh, so that we can have uh, a professional organization of um, young professionals who are going out into the world and uh, taking on some uh, some pretty extraordinary responsibilities. Um, so, um, what could, what could you say uh, to a potential uh, new Chirp uh, intern uh, about what you learned um, at Chirp and what some of that value uh, has created for you as you uh, go out into the world? Yeah, sure. So first, I think it's a great idea. Uh, it was certainly instrumental to where I've been now. And I think just to start, just kind of on a high level, I think um, all of us are a reflection and, of the people that we've met. And also we are um, where we are today because of people who are willing to sacrifice on our behalf and, you know, go out and provide some type of opportunity for us. Uh, and Chirp did that for me. So I'm, you know, forever going to be grateful to you, Devin, and to the work Chirp did for providing me for an opportunity to be engaged in the community. Um, and I think that's the benefit, one of the big benefits of CHIRP is you're going to college for an education, you think about things theoretically, but with the CHIRP program, you actually get to go out into the community, whether you're working on you know, an engineering side, if you're looking at technology, or you may be engaging in local politics with the mayor or the city council, you may be getting direct organizing experience going door to door. But the point is you can really connect what you're learning in the classroom to implementation on the ground. And I think one of the best lessons that I got in college in my public policy program was that policy doesn't stop once you enact something, right? A legislature passes a bill and the media goes crazy and it's great, but you really gotta focus in on what does implementation look like? Is this bill designed to be implemented effectively? Who is gonna be implementing it? And through CHIRP, I really learned how some of these California climate programs are being implemented on the ground, both you know, some of the positive sides, but I think even more so having an understanding of just how difficult it is to implement some of these really, really important policies. So the benefit of a mentorship program or a CHIRP internship in general is to give you that practical experience while you're in school and then also connect you with people who are in CHIRP or people who are in the community who've had 30 years careers, 30 year careers in a different field and really getting to learn from their experience and their knowledge and their wisdom um, so you can learn from the mistakes and not make similar ones down the road. And I really think that's going to be important, especially as it relates to climate change, because we're on such a short timeline, right? So 30 years, 40 years can seem like a long time. But when you think about the transformational change we're going to need across every sector of the economy, buildings, agriculture, electricity, how long it takes to get transmission lines right and to upgrade a home or whatever it may be, we really need to get things right uh, more often than not. So learning from our experiences, we have a plethora of experience in energy policy uh, and electricity markets, whatever it may be, we really need to use that wisdom and knowledge to get it right over the next couple of decades. Um, and I think a CHIRP program will give students who are just coming out in the world who are excited to work in this space, the practical experience, and then also the type of mentorship they need to learn these lessons before they necessarily have to make the decisions themselves. Well, you, you spent a few minutes here talking about uh, the benefits to you uh, yeah. from being a part of the CHIRP program, but I also just wanted to take this opportunity to uh, reinforce to you uh, how valuable you and uh, the rest of the students uh, have been uh, to us. Uh, just for everybody's um, uh, information out there who are listening, 
uh, Tom um, ultimately became the project manager of our program called the 50 Home Challenge, uh, which was an effort to uh, do two things. Uh, number one, to, to create a grassroots educational outreach program in, in the local community in Claremont to educate people on the power and benefits of energy efficiency, which is one of the primary and kind of fundamental methods of uh, mitigating greenhouse gases because of the outsized effects of the building sector on uh, greenhouse gases. So we, there, it's a great idea to think about energy efficiency in the building sector. And, and like Tom was saying, it's a great idea to have policy uh, to inspire that sort of behavior. Uh, but if you don't have people on the ground going door to door and creating workshops and meeting with people and addressing their concerns and their, and, and, and their fears about spending money, for example, on their home and what could it provide, you will never have a policy be effective. And so uh, one of the things that we have focused on um, is community engagement and education. And Tom and the other students, I think the, the semester, Tom, that you ran the 50 Home Challenge, we had uh, over 100 students from the Claremont Colleges signed up. I think it was like 120 students. Um, and you got a chance to run uh, and organize those students in a very meaningful way. Um, and so I just wanted to say, number one, thank you uh, for that effort, because it was uh, hugely valuable to CHIRP. Um, you guys actually executed um, our dream of a 50 home challenge. Um, and maybe you could talk a little bit about uh, that intersection between policy and uh, on the ground community engagement. Sure. Well, thank you, Devin. Yeah, that was, that was a great semester. It was a fun semester. I learned a lot and we really had a lot of students who were really excited to get engaged and bring you know, the various skill sets they had to the table. I'd also point out that I think, I'm estimating, but 80 to 90% of the students had to have been first years too. So it was a whole cohort, cohort of Pomona and Pitzer and Scripps and the other college students who were really excited to get involved and were willing to go out in their first year of college and talk to community members about energy efficiency. Um, but you do bring up a really important point, uh, again, about policy implementation, about the role of community, and implementing climate policies, et cetera. And I think a big thing to highlight here is the importance of trust, right? So in the California example, in the energy efficiency example, California is doing a lot of good work implementing policies and putting money behind energy efficiency upgrades and electrifying transport, especially in communities that are environmentally disadvantaged. So they face a disproportionate amount of pollution in their communities. Um, but if you think about it, you know, you can, put all the money into grant programs if you want, but if people don't know those grant programs exist or they don't trust the science or the rationale or the economic reasoning behind why they should do this upgrade to their home, or they just don't trust the government in general, you're gonna have a very hard time actually using that money how it's intended to be used, which is to help those folks to improve health outcomes and economic outcomes and address climate change. And we experienced that firsthand because we went door to door and a lot of folks just didn't trust the information that we were giving out, right? It was a fact that if you met a certain economic threshold, you could get a free solar power uh, roof uh, system on your roof or a complete energy retrofit of your home for free or basically free, but people just didn't believe that. And a lot of that comes to trust. So what we did is, uh, and it was not just the 50 home challenge, this was a result of Chirp's work over you know, decades or however long you've been working on this to get the city council on board, to get students involved, to get local businesses being supportive. Um, and also, I think one of the unique things we did is in addition to the 120 students or whatever we had involved, we also had 40 community members who are willing to go out and say, hey, I did this on my home. It works great. I'm saving money. And I think you should do it too, right? So it was their neighbor going to talk to them someone they already trusted for the last 30 years, and that's where we really saw the results. Um, so investing in that community leadership, and it's not just the mayor or business leaders, it's also just getting neighbors excited about the possibility of participating in this you know, 
energy transition and climate movement is really important, right? And I think when we think about climate change, it's got to be about how every single person has a role in that transition. You know, you don't have to be an environmentalist. You don't have to be someone who's, you know, banging on the uh, uh, doors of Congress. You could be someone who's creating the energy efficiency upgrade on your home and then telling your neighbor about it, right? You're someone who's eating a healthier diet, a less carbon intensive diet and getting your community to do it, right? There's a role for every single person in this and explaining that in a way that is accessible and empowering, whether you're a student or a community member is really important. I think that's gonna be important for public policy and, and community building. So we can advocate, and I know we're gonna talk about this for these big policy changes, which I spend 95% you know, of my time doing, but it's also really important for organizations like CHIRP and similar organizations to build the infrastructure on the ground where these can be implemented smoothly and effectively. Well, that might be a really good uh, uh, segue at this yeah. point to, uh, to kind of go from, uh, from the grassroots uh, to, the, to the world policy stage where you have spent uh, quite a bit of time actually, even starting uh, in college, working with uh, getting a price on carbon. Mm -hmm. um, even, even, even on the, uh, the world uh, political stage. So maybe uh, talk a little bit about your, uh, your focus um, on, on that, uh, working with the World Bank and now with uh, C2ES. Sure, yeah, so I graduated in 2018 and then spent about a year and a half at the World Bank uh, in their climate change unit. And the World Bank has an entire team, well, they have an entire climate change unit, and then they have a specific team that focuses on carbon pricing programs. Um, and within that, they're kind of split between more technical people who are you know, helping countries measure their emissions and design the technical aspects of their program. And then a team that's more focused on the communications and advocacy side, which is the team that I was on. And what we did was really look at what are the political obstacles or knowledge obstacles, communications obstacles to preventing uh, wider uptake of ambitious carbon pricing programs across the globe. Um, so we worked on bringing businesses and NGOs and governments together to work through these problems. We worked with bringing countries that have you know, a significant amount of experience with carbon pricing to countries that are just starting to think about how to do this, to try to work through things. Um, we tried to look at key bottlenecks like economic competitiveness, right? Why should I put a carbon tax in my country if it's going to hurt domestic industry? You know, working through those challenges with businesses and with countries. Um, and what I, my specific role was I was the partner relations coordinator for what is known as the Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition or CPLC. And the CPLC is this coalition of about 280 partners across governments, businesses, and NGOs, think tanks, uh, universities that are working to advance carbon pricing. So my job was figuring out how we can work with that diverse group all across the world to advance carbon pricing. Um, so I did that for about a year and a half, happy to circle back to that. Um, mm -hmm. But where I'm at now is I started at the Center for Climate and Energy Solutions, C2ES, in February of 2020. So right before all the shutdowns happened. Um, and I think C2ES's role, we're a small think tank uh, outside DC and again, we work at the state level in the US, the federal level in the US, and then participate internationally as well. And I'd say our role is really taking um, complex technical topics related to climate change. So this could be public policy issues like carbon pricing, this could be climate change science, these types of things, and communicating them in a, well, in a way and in a targeted way to policymakers to help them advance these different tools, right? So we take carbon pricing and kind of cut through all the noise and figure out what do policymakers need to know to advance this policy? How can we work with our private sector partners to advance a carbon pricing bill in the Northeast or something like that? And I think our reputation is a trusted, uh, trusted communicator who can cut through the noise on this, work with diverse audiences across the aisle and try to advance good public policy that reduces carbon emissions and then also has good economic outcomes and societal outcomes. And my focus is um, I kind of bounce around a little bit, but I'd say primarily I monitor state level climate policy in the US. And then I'm involved on the federal and international level when it relates to carbon pricing, market based mechanisms, or climate finance. So this, this stuff is just very exciting to me um, that you uh, 
basically literally launched out of um, graduating uh, as a senior uh, from Pomona College and went right to work uh, on the world stage. Um, what, what, just in general, in terms of maybe stepping back, just, mm -hmm. just uh, a couple clicks, um, how do you see, what, what's your general um, uh, kind of perspective on um, how much traction, how much success uh, you feel you're having on the world stage around some of these issues of climate change and, and carbon pricing and mm -hmm. how, and kind of talking about the kind of the grassroots and then the, the, uh, the national and the world uh, level policy, how do you see those uh, coming together? Are you uh, generally kind of optimistic, pessimistic? Um, what's your synthesis uh, it, it, since you're kind of straddling uh, both worlds at this point? Yeah, sure. That, that's a great question. Um, as you know, I'm, I'm an optimist. I will remain an optimist. Um, we are, but I'm also a realist, right? I'm not a blind optimist. Um, we are facing a significant challenge when it comes to climate change, right? And I think we're seeing right now with the coronavirus pandemic, uh, the importance of smart public policy and government leadership and swift action um, in order to successfully respond to a public health crisis uh, similarly, we're going to need a swift, focused uh, reaction and, to address climate change. And that's not going to happen over a couple of months. That needs to happen over you know, the next 30 to 100 years over this time scale. Um, you know, the World Bank was a great place to go right after college because I had primarily been focused on California climate policy and U.S. federal policy. Um, so being able to work on car carbon pricing and climate policy more generally across countries all over the world. So completely different perspective, uh, different economic systems, different energy intensity, all these different things, different priorities. Thinking about climate policy from their perspective, or at least trying to, uh, really opened up kind of a whole new world of how I think about climate policy and then my perspective on where things stand. Um, so I, I'd say I'm both op optimistic and a realist in the sense that we're very much behind. Right. So we know the science. We know we need to get to by 2050. We know we need to get to on average by 2030, which is about a 50 percent reduction in uh, net GHG emissions by 2030 and then net zero across the globe in general um, by 2050 to avoid some of the most serious consequences. And we're just not on track to get there. We're seeing progress in certain parts of the globe, but there's other part other countries that are just far behind. Um, the reason why I'm optimistic is because of some of the opportunities and breakthroughs that we've had. So I think on a global scale beyond governments, the type of social movements you're seeing, the type of youth leadership you're seeing, the way companies are reacting in this moment, the way not just countries, but also uh, subnational cities and states and companies and NGOs are all committing and rallying behind the Paris Agreement. That's not something we've, we've seen in the past with international agreements, right? Because only mm -hmm. national jurisdictions are parties to an agreement. But if you look across, you're seeing major companies and states all committing to the Paris Agreement. So it really seems like the support and the momentum is towards the goals of the Paris Agreement, which is great. But again, you need to have the implementation, which we're not currently at. As far as opportunities go, um, there's a ton of finance being unlocked right now to respond to the current economic crisis. And countries have a really significant opportunity to use that finance to, I actually think, speed up the transition to a green and clean and sustainable economy, right? So the European Union already announced that they're gonna be using a significant amount of their resources towards a green and, and low carbon response which also has good economic outcomes as an aspect of it. Other countries are gonna to continue to respond economically and have an opportunity to do that. And I think you're seeing companies respond to that as well. Um, I think it was BP or maybe it was Shell or both of them came out and said that we actually see the current moment accelerating the transition to a clean energy economy. Uh, and I think they're right. There's a real opportunity to use the finance that's being unlocked to lead that transition. Um, and I'd say another reason why I'm optimistic is because I think the major financial players, right? So you think about the major investment banks, the regulatory agencies, et cetera, they're starting to figure out that climate change is a huge risk to the financial system. 
So if you start aligning financial incentives, which is hard to do, but a lot of people are talking about it now. If you start aligning financial incentives towards a low carbon and zero carbon pathway, things can move a lot quicker than they're happening right now. And I think we're on a path to do that. And I think once we start getting those incentives right, we're going to move quicker uh, than we think is possible. I think, I forgot the exact phrase, but um, you know, you move, you, you feel like you're moving slow and it makes you realize, uh, you, it makes you underestimate how quickly you can move. And I think we're moving slow right now, but once we start really accelerating, it's going to go really fast and we'll start having breakthroughs in electricity and some of these technologies like direct air capture and battery technology. Uh, and I think we'll be successful. So we're not where we need to be. I think the incentives are starting to align on the right path. And then I think once we start going in the right direction, the momentum is going to be undeniable uh, and we're going to be able to solve this problem. That is one of the things that's optimistic to me, even in the face of, um, uh, the dire statistics and the IPCC report that uh, we really have uh, very little time to act. But what I see around the world um, in all of our communications and the pe people that I'm meeting uh, literally around the world, there are just literally tens of thousands of people coming on board every year to try and do what they can to help. Right. And that, that's demonstrated at the ground level here in Claremont and Pomona as we get ready to, to launch our first nonprofit solar panel assembly factory in the world. And just the hundreds of people who are, are willing to help, want to help, they, they know that they'd like to do something and they have just, they're just jump at the chance to have an opportunity to do something uh, to move the needle. And just the tens and thousands of young people that are springing up all across the world, ready and willing uh, to to do um, to work on projects um, like you like you are working and the students. We had 38 students um, from the Claremont Colleges and Cal Poly Pomona, uh, representing uh, five different uh, colleges, university, and uh, graduate school, uh, working on projects here in Claremont around climate change just extremely exciting. So one of the things I wanted to circle back around with uh, before we run out of time um, yeah. is, is the idea of um, the next gen um, kind of uh, CHIRP mentorship program and uh, what that might mean to uh, the alumni. Uh, what, do you what do you think about that as a uh, possibility and you being involved in kind of helping uh, to roll that out? Yeah, sure. So. Just to finish on that last thought, because I think you, you made a great point about how everyone wants to be involved in this, right? It's not just the environmentalists or the policy people, it's really everyone. And you see that showing up in uh, employees who are pressuring, pressuring their companies to do more on climate change. You're seeing it show up in customers when they're buying a car. You're seeing it show up when you know students in engineering schools or they go into business or they go into law to work on climate change. Right, so you're kind of having this uh, avalanche effect of people wanting to work on climate and relating it to wherever they are currently, you know, working or, or in their community, uh, and that can have a significant impact as well. Um, so a, right. a mentorship program is a fantastic opportunity. Um, I can speak to the experience at the Claremont Colleges, and I'm sure this is true in many communities and especially college towns uh, who emphasize, you know community and, and service and these types of things as well, is that students are really excited to get involved in this process. Um, they have a lot of skills, you know, through their experiences through college to allow them uh, to succeed and, and participate actively. Um, and any additional resources that a program like CHIRP can give, especially if they're targeted resources, gonna help them take that next step. Um, and something that I tell Claremont College students a lot when I talk to them is when they graduate from their undergraduate program, uh, you know, I can speak to the public policy program and public policy is those students are ready right off the bat to participate actively in public policy discussions at the highest levels of government. Yep. I think young people and students tend to underestimate their ability to participate and their contribution, et cetera. But as someone who's been out for two years now and kind of seen the lay of the land and different people who are working in this space, I absolutely encourage students to be confident in their ability to contribute and the knowledge that they already have. Of course, 
there's always opportunities to grow and be better and to learn. And as you go out, you start learning, you know, what your weaknesses are, what you can continue to grow in to become a more effective advocate or engineer or scientist, whatever it may be. Um, so the beauty of a program like a chirp mentorship program, and of course, I'm happy to participate. I'd love to, you know, play a leadership role, whatever you need, is that uh, if you create it in a way where it's providing very targeted resources for students, right? So if a student goes to DC, one of the first things they're going to learn if they don't know it already is they have to learn how to write. You got to be able to write a one to two page paper on a complicated policy topic and be able to communicate it to your boss or a member of Congress in a way that's easily accessible and you get straight to the key points. And that's a skill you have to learn that takes practice. Um, so, you know, having a mentorship program where someone who's got a lot of experience in that can lend a couple hours a week to a different student to help them with that would be very valuable. So you could set it up in a way where, you know, I'm a, one of the mentors from the program and a student sophomore at the Claremont College is interested in public policy. Session one, we just get to know each other, figure out what he's really interested in doing. Session two, we already know that he wants to develop uh, uh, a better writing ability, especially writing short memos. So session two is all about writing a memo. Maybe we do another session on that. And then session four, maybe they're just generally interested in networking and we do a session on networking in DC, which I think is also a specific skill that isn't necessarily taught in college uh, the right way. So I mm -hmm. think any way you can design the program where going in, students know and can sign up for targeted resources, for writing, uh, something scientific, engineering, tech, whatever it may be, um, that's going to make it easier for students to pick what they want to do. It's going to make the mentor's time uh, more valuable and useful because they, they know right off the bat what this student wants as opposed to kind of going through that process and thinking, you know, is this really what they're looking for? Instead of actually having like a curriculum ready, uh, could be really valuable. And especially for CHIRP because in the community and among students, you have such a range of expertise and experiences, right? So you have students studying public policy and econ and public health and whatever it may be. So it's going to be valuable to a number of different students. It could even be valuable to me, right? So I'm a mentor. If I was a mentor and I did public policy, if there was someone who was focused on, uh, you know, public health, the connections between climate change, air quality, and um, COVID-19, that would be absolutely fascinating to me and something I don't have time to think about. So it's like a great opportunity to foster that uh, knowledge, knowledge exchange. Yeah, you made a really great point that I would like to underscore uh, for any uh, potential students uh, or potential interns who are listening. And that is that um, oftentimes internship programs uh, talk about the value that they can provide to uh, the students. Um, but I uh, would like to underscore exactly what you said is that their uh, CHIRP uh, over the last decade has received tremendous value from our interns. And you do have a voice out there. You, you, you have a lot to give just from your perspective, just by having already gotten into college and by focusing on professional activities now in college, you have a lot to offer um, and you have a voice and you can make a difference. And that's the platform that we like to provide at CHIRP because um, uh, we would not be the organization, quite frankly, we are today. Uh, without having had um, interns uh, like yourself, Tom, come through the program and actually help us shape and create and execute those programs in a very real way. It's been, it's been um, a joy for me. Um, it's been a joy for me to know you, Tom. I and, appreciate uh, And I just, uh, I appreciate your time here. There, there's so many other things to talk about. I know that you're, uh, you're involved heavily in DC on a lot of levels. You're involved in um, uh, all kinds of environmental policy issues now coming up to elections and um, just very exciting uh, what you're up to. And I just uh, really appreciate your taking a little bit of time with us here uh, to share your life and um, a little bit of your experience with us. So it's been, it's been a pleasure to spend a, a few minutes with you here today, Tom. Of course. Thank you so much, Devin, for yeah. inviting me on and, 
and for the conversation. And I'll just kind of close on uh, exactly what you were just touching on there. And that is that I encourage any students listening who participate in CHIRP um, to not be afraid to take on a leadership role. I think one of the best mm. parts of mm. CHIRP for me and for my fellow students who went through the program is that there was space to lead and for your ideas to be heard and for you to really be passionate about your idea and run with it. Um, so if you have something you're excited about, I encourage you to run with it and I'm sure it's gonna benefit the program uh, in the community as a whole. So thank you so much, Devin. I look forward to continuing the conversation and uh, wishing you well. Thank you, Tom. Stay safe out there, stay excited. <laughs>